Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start by telling a little bit of my story. Originally, I planned on just going into finance and math, but not as many people get excited about finance and math as I do. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, a disclaimer, I'm not going to call out any organizations or name any specific stock stuff. We're just going to keep this high level and talk about how we can inject some fuel into the industry to ensure that we can continue to expand psychedelic research and psychedelic practice. Um, but I'll, I'll open with a bit of a personal story tying into the intro. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for being here. This is really uh, amazing that seeing you all come together. Um, so it's, it's not a really uh, lovely thing to say, but um, I'm an always recovering addict. And people often don't put together this idea of being an addict with being um, Canada's top female entrepreneur, some of these things that we might consider to be noteworthy, respectable pieces of paper. Um, it just so happened my like early addiction was uh, to be worthy. And that led to a lot of other addictions which involved substances and workaholism. And people don't think workaholism is an addiction, but it can be very um, damaging to your community and the people around you. So. I yearned um, deeply for success and acceptance, and I used a lot of drugs along the way to make me uh, feel like I could do that, and then I got those things. Um, and when I reached the mountaintop and I you know, had a bit of money and a bit of notoriety and all these things I thought I was meant to do, it was like a smart monkey. I jumped all the hoops and ticked all the boxes, and I thought I'd get there and I would feel whole, um, but I had never felt more hollow. And I had been in therapy. Uh, I started when I was eight years old. It was my um, first suicide attempt was when I was eight. Uh, so I'd spent a long lifetime in all sorts of types of therapy and taking all sorts of SSRIs and all variety of other things. And uh, by, by luck, um, a girl who was dealt to me in life in my undergrad, actually, was one of the first working with an organization called Theracil in Canada. Um, and in Canada, and congrats to Ben for saying Saskatchewan well, uh, I really like feel proud to represent Canada a little bit because we've been doing some great work. And, it, and we were some of the first to, to grant patient access through our government. And my good friend was working with uh, them. She's a general practitioner, and she just started sending me research in the way that a good friend would without approaching me and saying, man, you're really fucked up. We got to solve you. She started sending me research and research, and I'm reading and reading. And, um, and that gave me permission to find someone to start my own psychedelic journey. Um, and I had, as I said, done a lot of drugs as a, I was a committed hobbyist. Um, and I went into my first session with a little bit of bravado, like, oh, I've got this, this will be super fine. And uh, it was an entirely e different experience than anything I had done before. Um, by virtue of, uh, of a lot of the things that you will have already heard talk about and the things that you'll hear more about um, with future sessions around the, the deliberate nature of how the practice is administered and the preparation and the, set and the setting and uh, I came out of it with hope, and am proud to say I am um, a patient of psychedelic medicine. And so when I came out of it, I sold my companies. This wasn't like you know a random revelation on the after the first session. After about the first two years of my work, I decided that if I had um, one spin on the blue planet, I might commit it to something a bit more meaningful than building roads and bridges and dams and airports around the world, which is what I used to do. I had a large, heavy civil company. Uh, and I might advance, hopefully, a little bit, do my small part in psychedelic medicine. So founded um, a company that was called MindCure. And I think part of the interesting thing for me about being on this stage is that MindCure was one of the first publicly listed psychedelic companies, uh, and we were among the first to be uh, defunded. There's been a lot of movement 
on the financial side with respect to psychedelics. And despite the fact that we had a lot of money left, we didn't have enough to finish what would have been our first clinical trial. Um, and the idea of raising capital has become more challenging. So I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of a sense of how I've seen the finance of the industry come together, as some ideas about where I might see it going, and, um, and then I'll do a little bit of Q&A. So this is it, types, alignment, and the future. Um, I'm gonna start out with like a little bit of a sad story, but I think it's actually kind of positive. There's this joke um, in, in the financial industry about there's some for the bulls, which is a market that's really aggressive, and there's some for the bears, which is a market that we're in right now where people are a bit more conservative, but there's none for the pigs. Um, and we had some of that behavior in, in typical Typically in capital markets, we have this like, you know, sometimes there's some pigs who show up at the party. And there was a bit of that in early psychedelics. Um, so like, as Ben mentioned, a lot of the money that flowed into psychedelics in the early days came out of our Canadian uh, cannabis boom. So a lot of folks made a lot of money in cannabis and they wanted to support something else. And a lot of those people um, believe in plant medicines by virtue. And some of those people just believe in making money. And I'm a fan of money, I call them freedom units, so I'm not gonna put any capitalists down in, in, in that way. Um, but this is, I haven't named who these stocks are, but this is generally speaking how our industry has been performing over the last couple of years. Um, and there have been some notable things that have happened along the way. A lot of people were waiting for big results out of a number of organizations, and some of the results that have come in have been positive. Some of them have been mediocre, some of them haven't been that great, but that's also drug research. Like that is what we're talking about when we're talking about funding of this part of this industry. It's going to behave a little bit like this. I'm gonna show you a, about a two and a half minute video and I'm gonna narrate a bit over it just to tell you about the beginning. Uh, well, let's call it the new beginning. There was a long history of psychedelics before any of the capitalists really, really showed up. Um, I like to think this is Rick Doblin in maps. <laughs> so if Rick, you're here, this is, this, is, this is a little bit about you. Building this machine and kind of like grinding away, getting it going. Noting some of these like complex parts and how much goes into starting an industry like this. There's like so many pieces that have to come together to start creating um, something we can align with. <laughs> and there's some parts of it that look a little bit, you know, tremendously engineered. And some pieces that are getting figured out along the way as best we can. And then you, when you really can look at it, you start to notice there's like not just drug development, but there's training of therapists, and there's the locations that we're going to be doing this work in, and there's integrating the rich history of medicine work that's been done before us. And then different parts start to show up, and, and pieces of research show up, and you start to hear all these different nuanced things within the industry, but the fuel, at the beginning was really philanthropy, but it keeps being powered and more and more pieces get put into the pie because people are investing in this space. And then there's the breakdown. <laughs> and the music kind of stops. And every known CEO in the space is this guy just like trying to keep alive. And this is a little bit what's still happening now. It's hard to get funding. Some of the great programs are still proceeding, but um, trepidatiously, you know, with a lot of care. And uh, then, you know, my hope is that this happens again. But it starts with a little bit of a different tone than the first one started with. 
first one's like high pitched and a little bit fervent, but really excited and frothy, and everybody jumped in. And then this is a little bit more bass driven. It's a bit more focused with a deeper and richer understanding of how the industry might play out. Because we have more information than we did when we started. And we start pulling different levers at different times. Um, isn't that an amazing contraption this guy built? That actual clip is like seven minutes long. If you ever want to just get into a zombie meditation, you can just watch that guy mess around with it forever. It's very cool. They're from Sweden. They're called Winter Garden. So I give the, the um, correct. Oh, can you, can you forward or am I working? Here we go. Um, so I'm really positive. As much as I started with some stock charts that are like kind of negative and just, um, I'm super positive about the space. And so my message here today is, really going to be around how can we reimagine how we apply capital to the space and how do we deliberately do that in a way that we, you know, maybe don't have another breakdown in the same way. Um, but a lot has changed. So time has passed, obviously, and social norms adopt. I don't know how many of you have recently seen there's um, this guy, Prince Harry, who's released a book and there was this uh, Anderson Cooper interview where he talks about the use of psychedelics. And so this, I, I will often say like, data moves science and story moves culture. And I think we're in a time where the story is moving the culture greatly. And more and more people are telling their stories. Um, and more and more people are, are identifying the other in some of the people who are storytelling. So, you know, I'm like a typical, average mom of three driving a minivan, uh, and I have been five years in psychedelic therapy myself. Sorry, I'm burning up here. I'm just going to take this off. Um, not many of us are princes and princesses, so we can, we can maybe relate to Harry, but not in all the same ways. But I think, you know, this idea of people telling their stories is really going to help people have a lot more confidence in the culture adaptation and, and acceptance of it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm positive about that. The markets have shifted into a bear market, but that's okay. I mean, I actually see times like this as opportunities to really scrutinize and identify the people who are doing some of the best work. You know, when it's frothy and exciting and everybody's just piling in, it's, it's like, I like to get on an exciting ride too. And when there's a long lineup, I usually get in it. I don't even know what we're, what we're going or what we're doing. I'm like, this is gonna be fun. And I'm like, what the hell did I sign up for? Uh, but this, so this is a time to really reflect and, and slow down, like the last panel was talking about, and be deliberate about where we apply our resources. And there are leadership dynamics, you know? Um, and by that, I mean there's different types of leaders in every given space. Uh, I always love to give so much credit to Rick and the folks at MAPS who were doing this work deliberately in any way, and so many people who were in this space for such a long time doing this work before it was sexy and exciting and on the cover of all these magazines. Um, but there will be leadership changes within our industry in the next three to six months that I think will be material, which will also re-enliven people's um, interest. And this idea of event horizon, I think this is one of the things I just, if there's you know, three things you come away with um, from my speaking with you today, one of them is, this is gonna take a bit of time. <laughs> We're all so excited about it and want it now. Um, and I'm on the bus, like I would love it now. But a lot of the money that poured into psychedelics um, thought this was gonna be like 18 months. And we're all gonna be in the warm care of some folks dealing with whatever our life's trauma uh, is. And that's just not the case. The event horizon is much longer when we think about the deliberate drug research is going on, and, and not only that, then where are all the therapists who are going to do the work, and where are all the locations, um, where are all the integration kind of practices, and um, so it's longer than we expected. But 10 years ago, it doesn't seem that long ago when I think about, you know, a lot of different things. I'm curious. I always like to be curious about what people think. I, I'm like, 
I, I set up this whole thing to be all these neon lights, and then I tried to find a market adoption curve, and they don't do those in neon lights, so this is the best I could come up with. Uh, so bear with me. But this is, you know, my typical MBA kind of world is, is this innovator, early adopter, early majority, late majority, and laggards kind of idea. And so we have the majority of folks here in this kind of up in the middle, and then we're out on the fringes on the other side. And there's another, there's another kind of paradigm. You can describe it as enthusiasts, visionaries, pragmatists, et cetera. You can read. Um, and I, maybe by a show of hands, if we're okay with that, um, I'll go through them, and I'm just curious where you think we are with respect to you know, the willingness of people to participate in psychedelic therapy, just like en masse. Think about like whatever holiday, dinner party, you're looking around, and there's like Auntie you know, Beatrice and Uncle Jim and whoever. Um, how many people think we're still in the innovator stage, like this really kind of early, a few? How many folks are thinking we're like early adopters? It's pretty, yeah, that's, that's happening, okay. What about early majority? I like your hopefulness. Thanks <laughs> me joy. So by show of hands, I'm guessing we don't have any late majority or laggards. That's for later, we'll say that for later. That's good. There'll be dessert. Um, I feel like, personally, we're still in the innovator stage. I feel like we're in a bit of an echo chamber. We're like the believers. We're like the early people who showed up at the party. We're setting everything up and we're, you know, getting the band going and, we're, and, and we know it's going to be a great event. Um, but even still for me, I've been in this work five years uh, openly and at Thanksgiving dinner, my sister-in-law turned to me and she was like, I hear that people are using small amounts of mushrooms to feel better. You, I think you might know something about that. I'm like, are you here right now? I've been in your foot, the hell? Um, but it wasn't until it became a storyline that she read all the way out here that she actually started tuning into the fact that we've all been talking about this for a long time. So I feel like we're still here. Um, and I love that lots of folks think we're a little bit further along, but I'm encouraging people to think about if we are still in this very early, on these very early days, we still have a lot of opportunity to adapt how we fuel and fund the model in a way to make it really maybe a bit more deliberate. Because out of the gates, um, these are all the ways that we get money into the system, or many of them, so government, academic, philanthropic, crowd and sea funding, uh, angels, larger funds, corporate bootstrapping, and public markets. And um, the early days were really these first three, government, academic, and philanthropic. And, uh, and, and a lot of that is based on curiosity, great scientists being significantly curious in something, because they're not necessarily interested in what's going to solve the biggest problem or make the most amount of money. Could just be that I have a personal connection to opiate use disorder because I lost an uncle to it, and I want to solve that, and that's, that's going to be my research. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do it, and there's kind of these stages when I think about breaking down where do we want to put gas and in what time? Like, what do we want to fund in what order? And we got that a little bit wrong, I think, out of the gates. So this idea of safety, this is drug development. I think we need this. Uh, as much as there have been lots of folks practicing, I'm a Métis person of Canada, so I'm a, an official First Nation person of Canada, and I lovingly respect um, the early practice of our people with respect to plant medicine. But I believe that for my Uncle Jim to partake, his um, paradigm in the modern world is that he's going to need to get a prescription from a person who's called a doctor or a psychiatrist to go and get therapy. That's just how I feel. So this drug development part is so important. The sage, we can call them a Sherpa, we can call them a therapist, we can call them all sorts of things, but I was looking for an S word and it fit. Uh, but this is a training and learning. And um, and we're going to need a lot of people to do this. And we're still, I think, way behind. So money can go there. But the trick about that is they're not going to be making any money for a long time. So we could trade a lot of people up who have nowhere to go because it's still illegal. So we're kind of in a chicken and egg here. Um, we 
think about the stat, this is really the culture piece, and this is where you know there's companies spending money on marketing, there's lots of press that comes out, um, but I think this is a really important part because as much as we think maybe we're a little bit further along, I do believe typically it takes seven impressions to change a mind, right, for the narrative to kind of ping in our head, and so if I read about Prince Harry and maybe I saw a thing in the Times and maybe I saw a thing in Cosmopolitan magazine or something, it takes a long time for people to get that this is actually happening. And so I think this middle piece is somewhere where money still needs to be spent as much as I don't let, you know, love marketing, but it is important. And the infrastructure as well. But again, it's a chicken and egg. We don't want to build too many things out before we can actually generate the revenue. And then we think about all the supporting things. So who's, who are making the drugs and who's distributing the drugs and where are we going to house them? And then I mean, I love technology, so there's all these like wonderful applications and companion apps being built and AI-driven music to have in your sessions. And, and then there's a re regulatory piece. So it's not just funding psychedelics. Like all of these small component pieces, in what order, in what time, it gets a little bit complex. And so this is kind of, this is what, when I, when I step way back, I think about Okay, if we're gonna put some money in a thing, what's the hypothesis about it? Have we had a discussion about it? Do we know what the goals are? The beginning was just like, psychedelics are good. Money. <laughs> um, and, and then it was like, psychedelics could be great and big. Money. Uh, and then it was like, wait a minute. Psychedelics are still good, but I am, I have to fly to Peru and people think I'm weird doing them and the time horizon thing came in um, and this idea of returns gets a little touchy when we're talking about healthcare. And I know it's a really challenging subject and it can, all, you know, like the ha kind of the hackles go up within most rooms I talk about funding in psychedelics because it feels like there's this tension between what we know to be the lived experience um, and the connection to the oneness and the, that we are all in the planet. And then, you know, capital markets. Just like even in my mouth right now, it's like, ah. Um, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm a strong supporter because this is a fuel that we have. I mean, you know, just like imagine the people at MAPS still doing this on their own, and here we are two years later, with so many companies, so many people employed and doing the, doing the research and, and building this kind of ecosystem. Um, so for anyone who's in the audience, I just built this slide. So if you're a person who's interested in being a part of any of these spaces, this is the kind of place that you might start looking for your capital, in my opinion. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Like, if you have a question about your own business, we'll do that privately and after. We won't like, you know, imagine questions for the all. Um, but this can be helpful for people who are thinking about. Um, and, and I didn't have enough space to answer if you want to do any of that production stuff, so we could talk about that. But you're probably too early. Not totally, but or you have a lot of money, because it's gonna take a while. Um, and I, I just wanna talk a little bit quickly about this model that's designed by a guy, um, Roger Martin, based at the University of Toronto. And I, I used to teach a class um, at Western University in the MBA program called Design Thinking. And so there are elements of like the creative process. We often think like science and creativity are two separate things. I believe that they're often, and when they're best, the very same thing. Um, it's an artistic process, um, and then you apply a bit of science, and you have to do a bit more art and creativity to apply a bit more science. And I see this as both how we're exploring and developing psychedelic practice in its medical application, as well as kind of our experience as patients um, in going through psychedelic practice and healing. And it starts with this idea of the mystery, like we, we don't know. It's gonna figure it out. Um, we have some ideas and maybe some clues about what this could be like. We've, we've created a vision of what psychedelic practice applied in medicine could look like. Uh, and for my own self, and I'll, I'll just speak as a patient, the first time I went in, I was, you know, I had a vision of what it might look, look like or be like. 
Um, and then you go down to this next thing, which is the heuristic. And heuristic is really this idea of like, we're starting to get informed. We're collecting a little bit of information. We're starting to notice some patterns. And we're starting, though we still have some assumptions. There's still some assumptions we're gonna need to test out. And most of the testing can't be done, um, I'm gonna call it academically. We have to apply it. People have to be taking drugs in rooms with people and we're testing it out. This is a drug research process. And for the individual person, this is the in state, in process. Like, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm solved yet. Um, and I heard, I heard Ben mention this part and I also just, aside from finance and as an as a individual going through this, I, we really appreciate if you just listen to the part where anyone talks about integration. I think it's such a tremendously important part of this process and it's, it's a part I think where a lot of this heuristic still has a lot to be discovered, is how do we take, like I blast into the universe and then I come home on a typical Tuesday and I walk in my house and my kids are like, hey mom, how are you doing? And I'm like, I just talked to God yesterday. <laughs> Uh, I forgave my mother. <laughs> so, you know, doing that alone, I, it, it, again, in my own experience, um, is hard. And I'm not sure that the best outcomes come when you're on your own trying to figure your own thing out. I really think we need community to support this. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions being made. And so this my end of my little soapbox on that piece. But I think it's an important part of this heuristic place where we're at at the moment. We just don't know enough. But then it becomes algorithmic. That's where we've kind of got it figured enough to have some strong predictions, you know. And this is a part where we've done enough research and when we, our ends are high enough and everybody said this is good enough and we apply it to the masses and we have a pretty good understanding. Uh, but the algorithms sometimes can still be a bit wrong. I don't know if you like, sometimes you get fed something you're like, really? I don't know, I'm into that. I like your suggestion, but, um, and this is a design force. The, the, the total sum of these is how much we have um, investigated, invested into how we deliberately design this. And I think because we are dealing with people's minds and their communities en masse, this can be amplified. If it's done well, like, you know, this is when I could get into the, we could potentially save the planet. It's a little extreme, but I kind of believe it. Uh, or we could potentially miss one of the greatest opportunities I think we will have in our lifetime um, to really affect change at a global scale. So where we put our money matters right now and the time, um, the time we assign to being deliberate about understanding where we're putting our money. Again, I opened with, I will not mention or provide any stock tips or tell you about who I think you should be backing or, or what should be done um, at that level. Uh, that's not really a good idea for me to do. But um, this is where I see the money coming from. So these are our good friends and researchers in the future in their spacesuits, drinking their coffee and messing with serotonin. These are the therapists and the training that's going on. Um, there, is a, there is a moment that's happening as well that I, that I wanna talk about. Again, it's like, I know that some of the people in this room are from the government or regulatory agencies, and we don't um, really wanna talk about necessarily the fact that there's a bit of a, a, a pacing issue that's happening right now, but I'm, I'm happy to address it because I like hard things. Um, there is an expansion of the market into lots of folks, and we heard about it in the last panel, going to places where people may not be well trained to access medicine because they're in pain and they've heard that there are solutions and they're, and they're hurting. Um, and they're going and buying mushrooms from their buddy's buddy and they're sitting in a room with someone who maybe doesn't necessarily know what they're doing. Um, there's a lot of money going into that because we can make a lot of money off of people's pain, if I'm honest. 
and whatever money goes into that, not entirely, but a lot of it could be going to another use if there was hope that we could move it more quickly. So if I have $100 to put into psychedelics because I believe in it with all of my soul, um, but I'm going to put it here and it's going to take 15 years to return, or I'm going to put it here and it's going to take three, I have to be really altruistic to do this. And maybe I'm going to do both, but I, I'm going to proportion that out in a different way. But if this looks like seven and this looks like three, I'm probably going to go here because it just feels better to go to sleep at night. Um, and then there's this regulated medical thing, and there's some interesting things happening in this with mail order taking off. We haven't really talked much about that in the States. There's a lot of ways that psychedelics are advancing rapidly and slowly. Um, so regulation is, is really important for the people in the room who are on that side of things. I am so grateful that you are here. I'm so grateful that you're openly listening to everyone who will be on this stage in the next couple of days. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's a pivotal time for regulators to, Canada started out really strong. We were, I was super proud of us and now we suck. Um, frankly speaking, our government has just absolutely stopped granting, we, they're called Section 56 exemptions. Uh, the very first 56 exemption was given to a, a, actually a guy from Saskatchewan, a farmer who had terminal cancer, who had um, end of life anxiety so badly he wasn't even living out what he had left. And he was the first person that the government of Canada granted access to. He did psilocybin journey with the folks at Theracil. And he has lived, uh, I don't know, he's 15 months, maybe not quite from his treatment. Uh, and it's getting kind of bad again. And he wants to do it again, but the government won't grant him access. And Thomas is a law-abiding citizen type of character. Um, and even though he knows all the people who could get him all of the mushrooms, and he knows that, you know, he just won't do it if it's not uh, legal. And the government of Canada has stopped granting 56s, and there's a pile of them. So we were out of the gates really strong, and I think showing some great global leadership. Um, and then our federal government kind of took their foot off the gas. So the province of Alberta, who typically is our most conservative province, usually the folks in BC, where I'm from, uh, are the people in the lineup to, we don't know where it's going to go, but it looks fun. Um, the Alberta people are like, wait a minute now. But Alberta has just come out with some um, regulatory timelines that are showing a lot of promise. And so to me, there is some hope when our most conservative province has said to hell with the feds, we need this, we need it now. There's a lot going wrong. We're gonna take, we're gonna take ownership of this. That's really important. And the runway is actually pretty short. I think if we don't, advance funding, um, regulatory change, and, and scientific research, the at-home market could really, it could advance really fast. And, and the anecdotal story moving culture might be different. We may not get the outcomes that Ben was talking about this morning without all of the therapy before and after and the integration, thoughtful practice. And then it probably doesn't spread as positively as we would like. Um, and there are realities of cost for care. It's just true. But I, I would also encourage you, if you hear that argument, really look at the math, look at where those things are coming from. Because um, my own expense, so to carry an addict like me, uh, costs the Canadian government about $580,000. Um, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I paid a bit of tax at that time, so I think I covered myself, so I, I feel okay about it. But most people aren't um, in the position to do that, and we can, we can help someone for a lot less than 580. I know that to be true, because that's my business, is mathematics, <laughs> making money. Um, so again, just kind of closing with some of these predictions, uh, this stark split between 
what I'm going to call the at home, at your own risk, at your own kind of um, hopes and dreams, it's splitting off right now rapidly because people are hearing that this can help and they're in pain. Um, I think there can be another better, longer term, more thoughtful way. I believe insurance coverage is coming. Uh, I sit on the board of an organization called Thank You Life, where we fund care for people who can't afford it. And we are launching a, a B2B arm that's starting to sell insurance. There's another organization that's just launched an arm to start to sell insurance to large companies who are willing to cover their staff. So it's not insurance companies offering it, it's people within the industry who are like, look, we can just go directly to businesses and say, hey, if you think you would like to allow your staff access to psychedelic therapies, ketamine, um, we can help facilitate that. So I believe it's coming and when insurance coverage happens, it's gonna be so beautiful. Um, licensing and acquisitions are on their way. When people start running out of money, they partner up. So we'll see a lot more of that happening in the industry, which I'm kind of hopeful for. It's not good for the people employed in the industry. It kind of makes for half of the jobs, but uh, it allows the research to continue. I think retreats and retail will have their day, but again, this is just a pacing issue of you know what's going to win. Um, and again, this idea of data moving science and story moving culture, there's a lot of research going on there's a lot of it, and, and, and we're on these kind of events. We're now at this event horizon where early, early results are coming in. Please don't be disheartened by something that is like 15% better than the typical results. Like we, I think everybody went, psychedelics are going to be like what Ben showed us, you know, like 72 versus 21 or whatever the numbers were, I forget. That is bloody astounding. Like, that is amazing. Um, and I think even 15% better is still 15% better. If someone you love was one of those 15%, you'd be damn happy for it. Um, and there's always funding for the right idea at the right time. Don't be discouraged if you're someone who came here to, to get involved in the industry and you're like, oh, the money all ran out. That's, that's not necessarily true. If you're timed right and you're thoughtful, um, the money, the money is there. There's a lot of people with a lot of money who really want to see this get done. Uh, so please don't be afraid. Um, and with that, I'll just take a minute. I, again, I know that finance isn't always the most exciting thing to talk about, but I'm happy to talk about that or open to talking about my own experience as a patient. You can ask me anything, just no questions about my sex life. <laughs> Back here. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just wondering, are you worried that investors will underestimate the importance of uh, preparation and integration? Mm. I do. I, I just think it's part of um, it's just part of a story we don't talk about a lot out there. So in here, we talk about it. We know about it. And oftentimes, if we've been patients of or experienced, we get it. But, you know, like again, the Prince Harry clip on CNN is like a big one right now. But he's not talking about what he did to go into that. He's not talking about the care he had after that. He's not talking about anything, you know. So I, I just think this, like, the, the culture of psychedelics has a little bit of a narrative of silver bullet. Like, go in, talk to God, solve the issue, go to work on Monday. And um, that's not been my experience. Uh, so, yeah, so I, 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 think, I think there's just more work to be done to be talking about that. I think people within the industry who want outcomes already know that that's an important part of it. Um, and I think you're going to see some great work being done um, on providing really structured education around integration and really structured education around preparation. It's just, again, it's been a bit of a timing issue, though. It's been too early, you know? Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Thank you. It was, I don't know, whoever's with the, yeah, you. Hi. Uh, Hi. Uh, thanks, uh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, is there any mapping of like the deal flow and the funding uh, size in different areas within this space? So I can give you, 
One of my favorite resources uh, in this space is called Psychedelic Alpha. The guys behind it are really discerning. They often will cover new deals. Um, there's still a lot of deal flow on like the private equity side of things and smaller deals. Um, but again, it just it's it's alignment of funds. So if you want to invest. 10 to 35 million dollars, you're looking at a drug dev deal. If you want to invest 100,000, you're looking at probably starting up a, you know, some little retreat kind of a thing. Um, so, but there is a lot of deal flow. I get decks sent to me all the time. Um, a lot of kind of adjacent industry things. So people are doing like functional mushrooms, just getting ready for the time when it's, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Crunch. Sorry, the the question was: Are there any like um, industry maps, like maybe on Crunchbase or or that kind of thing? Yeah, they do come out from time to time. The, the interesting thing about the and I guess early industry, everything moves pretty quickly. But typically, by the time they've produced it, it's out of date because there's so many market entrants. Like I think we were the fourth fourth go public, and now I think there's seventy some publicly traded, like specific psychedelic companies, never mind the, like, the huge number of others. So um, yeah, but I would say if you're just looking at deals and looking at like flow and that kind of thing, psychedelic alpha usually covers things pretty well. In the way back with the blonde hair, or we have another, okay, I'm just gonna stop pointing. You're in charge, I'll just respond. Yeah, I just wanted to give sort of an update about Canada that uh, in the Quebec government just over three weeks ago, they applied psychedelic assisted uh, psychedelic therapy, like in terms of health coverage. So it was just to yeah, give a little Yeah, the government bit of, of Canada just covered a direct, yes, which is super exciting. Thank you. Go Quebec, our French friends. Hi, so I'm just curious about the funding. Um, in regards to, I imagine that this might be something that uh, the drug companies wouldn't make, well, you wouldn't be able to make as much money from this as you would from patenting uh, a specific, specific mm. drug that's created in a laboratory, probably using the wrong language. Yeah, um, no, no. It's totally but good. I'm just trying to understand, you know, how are they, you know, are they going to be able to turn as much as of a profit from this? Mm. Are, we, are we looking at, are they actually going to be using the mushrooms or are they going to be taking a specific, you know, psilocybin out of it and yeah. creating a drug and patenting it? What is it going to look like? Mm. Uh, I worry a little bit about this also in, in, if you look at what they've done with cannabis, making synthetic cannabis. Yeah. And how, I don't know, I don't, I don't really think that that's been as beneficial as using the plant as a whole. So how, how is this going to look? Thank you. You're very welcome. This is, this is the question. Uh, so I suppose I have a position on the, on, the, on the synthetics versus other, and then I'll answer the drug dev question and the money-making question. Um, personally, I feel OK about the synthetics uh, if they're specific. Um, and they've gone through research. We did synthetic Ibogaine, um, which is known to treat opioid use disorder. And um, it's a little bit better on the planet when we figured it out. But you can also do the plant thing. I think choice of the human individual is like really important. So I'm happy that both things are happening. On the drug development side, that's where you see uh, they're often called NCEs, new chemical entities. So like Ben was talking about, they're doing an NCE with an MDMA-like. Um, so you can make money selling the drug because it's not a generic and generally available. So most psychedelic companies have tried to do some kind of NCE model. Uh, what the folks at MAPS are doing with MDMA, um, they'll still generate revenue, but it's not gonna be like traditional drug company. But what, we'll, what I foresee happening is like any form of drug development, and typically we're not that excited about watching drug development, it's just like psychedelics has taken a big part of that spotlight. The typical drug development path, if it's not already within like a Merck or a Pfizer or something like that, and you're a small biotech, you're going to get it to like the end of your phase two or maybe like phase three. Um, 
and then you'll get acquired by one of these large giants. It's usually what happens. I don't know if that's what will happen in this case. It's pro provided these companies keep being funded, they will happily stay sovereign and not be taken over um, because everyone will make probably more money that way than with a buyout. But again, that's just gonna depend on how things go. I also wanna like, and this may not be popular, but I'm also okay with that. Um, big drug companies are not always evil. Like they're helping a lot of people, probably people in this room are on drugs from big drug companies who took a lot of risk to develop the drugs that you're already on. Um, I think it's what they choose to do sometimes with their profits and the volume of profit that they choose to take where we can maybe question them a little bit. But being a drug company by, your, by its very nature doesn't make you bad. Um, so I think, you know, within our own industry, there are different organizations who see those things in different ways. So that's also true of psychedelics as well. Um, anyway, thanks everyone. I am out of time, but if anyone has any other questions, I'll just be loitering. So happy to chat with you.